we'll take Lord's Day 8 as our text. <clears throat> so just previously in Lord's Day 7, it is asked what the articles of our Christian faith are, and it then lists the Apostles' Creed, and following that, Lord's Day 8 asks the question, how are these articles divided? Into three parts. The first is about God the Father and our creation. The second about God the Son and our redemption. The third about God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. Since there is only one God, why do you speak of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because God has so revealed himself in his word that these three distinct persons are the one true eternal God. So far from our confession. Beloved congregation of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, what comes into your mind when you think about the Trinity? And what goes through your mind when you read or you hear something like the confession we made this afternoon with the Athanasian Creed? For some of us, it may have sounded a little confusing. Maybe we weren't quite sure what to think. For others of us, when we think about the Trinity, we know it's something that theologians like to talk about in elevated language, but maybe you're not exactly sure how this doctrine lands in your daily life and what importance it has for us as Christians. Well, this afternoon in Lord's Day 8, we're asked to think seriously about the Trinity. And I hope that you'll come to recognize this afternoon that confessing God as a triune God is in fact an essential part of our Christian faith. And why is that? Well, we're going to see two reasons this afternoon. And the first reason is simply because that's how God has revealed himself to us in Scripture. If you were to think just a few Lord's Days prior in Lord's Day 3, the question was asked, or at least it was explained, why God made us. God made us good and in his image. And one of the reasons we were made was so that we might rightly know God. And God has given us knowledge of himself in Scripture. And God calls us as his people to come to know him more. To know how he has revealed himself in the Bible. So the first reason is simply because God reveals it in Scripture. But a second reason that we must hold on to the doctrine of the Trinity is because our salvation depends upon it. In a very real and a practical way, confessing our God as a triune God has a, a real importance in our salvation. And we'll see that this afternoon, too, in our, in our sermon. So our theme for this afternoon, let us hold fast to the doctrine of the Trinity. And we have two points. First, because it's revealed in Scripture. And secondly, because our salvation depends upon it. So our first point, it's revealed in Scripture. Now, from time to time, there are people who like to suggest that the word Trinity is not actually found in the Bible. And because it's not found in the Bible, it's not something that you are held to believe. Now that's an interesting idea, but it's also a very nonsensical idea. Because just because a specific word that we use to describe a teaching of Scripture is not found in the Bible, it doesn't mean that that teaching is not there. Let me give you one more example. If you look through your Bibles, you aren't going to find the word incarnation in the text of Scripture. It's not there. But of course, we know for a fact that Jesus Christ was incarnated. He came in the flesh. You know, John 1 verse 14, the word became flesh. You don't find the word incarnation in the Bible, but the teaching is most clearly there. And the very same thing is true of the Trinity. Even though you won't find the word Trinity in Scripture, the doctrine that is behind that word most certainly is there. 
And you can find it already on the very first page of Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, darkness over the face of the deep. And then what does it say? It says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You get the sense that God, who created the world, is not alone. There's also his spirit present. And if you continue on in Genesis chapter 1, you get to verse 26. And what does God say about man? He says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And now ask yourself the question, who's this us? Who's this our? Why is he talking in the plural? Well, I think you're starting to see that there's already this idea coming into Scripture that there's a certain plurality within God. Something about God means he's not alone. We don't know exactly what that means in the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. But as you continue reading Scripture, as God continues to reveal himself in the Bible, this plurality that you see in the beginning is more fully explained until you come to the point we are as the church of Jesus Christ and we confess that there are three persons within God. And of course, Scripture teaches this as well. You could think of, for example, John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus Christ, after he has risen from the dead, appears to Mary Magdalene. And what does he say to her? He says to her, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus calls his Father, he calls our Father, God. Because the Father is God. Now what about the Son? Well, perhaps as Christmas time approaches congregation, you're probably going to hear in song or perhaps recited the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verse 6. You know, it says, To us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And of course, we know that when Jesus Christ comes, this promised child is Jesus. He is our Savior. And what does the New Testament teach about Christ? Well, it says, for example, in Philippians 2, verse 6, that Jesus Christ was in the form of God. Because Jesus Christ is also God. And then finally we know that the Holy Spirit is also a member of God. Acts chapter 5 tells the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They sell a field. They lie about how much money they've given to the church. And then what does Peter say to Ananias? He says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then he says, you have not lied to man, but to God. Peter equates the Holy Spirit with God because the Holy Spirit is God. The scriptures teach us these three persons are all God. And so we aren't surprised either when we come in scripture to those passages where we see all three persons mentioned together in the same breath. And it's as if they are equal in rank. Think with me of Jesus' great commission, Matthew 28. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name. The name of who? Well, it's the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One name, three persons. And at the end of this service this afternoon, you'll also hear that blessing, which you hear so often, taken from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Paul says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all those persons are God. Three persons, God. Now that's one side of the coin this afternoon. If you were to turn it over to the other side, you'd also happen to know that Scripture teaches the fundamental oneness of God. The Bible teaches just as clearly that God is one. One of the Israelites' fundamental confessions was the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, where they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or think, for example, of Isaiah 44, verse 6, 
The prophet says, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, I am the first and I am the last besides me. There is no God. And so we have these two sides of the coin, one that has three persons and the other that has one God. And the question is, congregation, how are we going to reconcile these things? How are we going to reconcile the truth that there is one God while at the same time maintaining that there are three persons referred to God? Now to tell you the truth, this is a hard thing for us to understand. It's a hard thing for us to comprehend. If you think about our common experience as human beings, there's really not a clear analogy that you can point to which somehow demonstrates an understanding of the Trinity. You know, maybe in books or in catechism class, you've seen some sort of diagram used to help you explain the Trinity, but the fact of the matter is these things always have a weak point somewhere. The Trinity is difficult for our human minds to understand. And yet at the very same time, this is how God reveals himself in Scripture. And he calls us to know him, and we have a duty to strive to learn about this triune God. And you'll be thankful to know this afternoon that, of course, we are not the first generations of believers to struggle to understand the Trinity, to try to understand how we should talk about our triune God. And we actually already heard this afternoon of one attempt, a very good one, to explain the Trinity, and that was, of course, in the Athanasian Creed. Some of the early church fathers wrestling with this doctrine wrote the Creed and confessed what they believed about the Trinity. And as you read through the Athanasian Creed congregation, there are especially two main ideas that it is continually seeking to describe and to differentiate between And if you're going to understand the Trinity this afternoon, you also will want to understand these two ideas. And these two things which the Creed talks about are are first, the person, and secondly, the substance of God. Person and substance. And we've already seen in Scripture that there are clearly three persons in God. And what does the creed tell us? Well, the creed told us this afternoon that we should never confuse these three persons. The Father is the Father. He is not the Son. He is not the Spirit. The Son is the Son. He is not the Father. He is not the Spirit. And the same goes for the Holy Spirit. They are three individual persons. Now I can give you an illustration of an ancient heresy That's something which you shouldn't believe, a heresy which the early Christian church dealt with. There was this heresy called modalism. Modalism emphasized the oneness of God, but it had this idea that God simply appeared in different modes or different persons at different times. It was almost as if one day he would put on the mask of the Father, the next day the mask of the Son, and some other day he'd put on the mask of the Holy Spirit. What this heresy did was it stressed the oneness of God, but it didn't emphasize the three persons. It confused the persons. Something the Athanasian Creed tells us not to do, something Holy Scripture does not teach. And yet at the same time, well, we must not confuse the persons and maintain that there are three. The Creed also teaches us we must never divide the substance of God. That's our second idea. The persons, but now the substance. The substance is one. What is the substance of God? Well, it's the fundamental nature of God. It's the attributes of God. The substance of God is what makes God who he is. And we confess in the creed that God is one substance. The three persons of the Trinity are all uncreated. They're all infinite. They're all eternal. They're all almighty. And yet there are not three uncreated persons. There are not three infinites or eternals or almighties, but there's one, one substance of God. And therefore, there is also just one God and one Lord. Now, this is actually a a place where Christians sometimes are accused, especially by Jewish people or perhaps by Muslims, 
that we are polytheists, that we believe in multiple gods. And they point to the doctrine of the Trinity to say that. But as we clearly confess this afternoon, congregation, we believe in one God. We worship these three distinct persons as the one true and eternal God because as the catechism says, God has so revealed himself in his word that these three distinct persons are the one true eternal God. Trinity and unity, unity and trinity. Three persons, one substance. And by seeking congregation to understand something of the Trinity, what we are doing is really fulfilling the will of God for our lives. We talked about this in Lord's Day 3. God created us to know him. Perhaps you can remember, maybe not that long ago, you also worked through Lord's Day 47, which speaks about hallowing the name of God. And what does it really mean for you to hallow the name of God? What are you saying when you pray the Lord's Prayer? Well, the Catechism teaches that one of the things about hallowing God's name is coming to rightly know Him. And as you seek more and more to understand the Trinity, as you understand God's teaching of Himself and His Word, you are bringing glory to Him simply by striving to know who He is. Now, as we come to our second point this afternoon, we also want to see that this this knowledge, it doesn't just stay up there in the air. It comes down and it lands with a very practical application. This glory of our triune God is indeed glorious, and we must hold to the doctrine of the Trinity, not simply because it's some interesting fact about God, but because our very salvation depends upon it. And so we're in our second point now. Perhaps you think that that's a rather bold claim for me to make, that our salvation depends upon the fact that we have a triune God. You know, doesn't our salvation actually depend on Jesus Christ? Doesn't it depend on his work of salvation that he accomplished on the cross? And of course, the answer to that question is yes. Our salvation in a very real way does depend on the work of Jesus Christ who came to this earth in the flesh and suffered and died in our place. But if you were to go back one step, congregation, and ask yourself the question this afternoon, why did Jesus come to this world? Why did God the Father send the Son into this world? Why did he suffer and die for your sins? Why did he suffer and die for my sins? Well, that question is answered, of course, by the most well-known verse in all of Scripture, John 3, verse 16, we all know what it says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. Jesus came into this world because of the love of God for you. We talked a bit about this morning. Why did God include you in his covenant? Why does he call you to accept covenant promises? It's because he loves you. And the same reason is why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Scripture even teaches, as we read from in 1 John 4, verse 8, that love is a fundamental part of God. Love is part of the substance of God. It says in 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. It's a part of who he is. It's not some secondary thing that he got a little bit later. God is love. He always has been. It's a part of his substance. And now I'd like to ask you this afternoon one more question. The question to consider is this. Would it be possible for God to be a God of love Would it be possible for God to have love as a fundamental part of his substance if he were not a triune God? Would it be possible for God to be a God of love if he were not triune? Think about it with me, congregation. If part of the substance of God is love, that means he's been loving from all eternity and he will continue to be for all eternity in that direction too. Before the world was ever created, God was love. 
And I would suggest to you this afternoon that this would not have been possible if there were not multiple persons within God. God could not be love in his substance if there were not multiple persons for that love to find expression. Now, this is something which we can point to in our everyday life, isn't it, congregation? If you want to show love, how do you do that? Well, there needs to be someone who you show love to. True Christian biblical love, you know, the giving of yourself for the good of others, well, there has to be others. You cannot be loving unless there are people to love. And so how would it have been possible for God to be a God of love if he was all alone? How could he be said to be a God of love if the Son and the Spirit were not also there in eternal fellowship with one another, showing eternal love? You know, you can't just say that God magically decided to start showing love when he created the world, because then he wasn't doing it before, and it wouldn't be a part of his substance. And you also cannot suggest that God was just loving himself the whole time before he created the world. You know, we sometimes say that, oh, you, you love yourself or love yourself. But that's not love. True love is a giving of yourself to others. If you love yourself, we call you a narcissist. That's not a good thing. And I've been going on about this for a while. But I want you to know I'm not just making this stuff up. I'm not the first person to realize the importance of a triune God being a God of love. And you can look at this another way by comparing our God with the God of Islam. Our faith, as well as the Jewish faith and the Muslim faith, it's all based on on Moses and Abraham in some sense. But our understanding of God is very different And so if you think about the Islamic faith, for example, they hold steadfastly to the oneness of Allah. To suggest that there are multiple persons within him, to suggest that the Son of God is also God himself, is is pure blasphemy. But what is the result? Well, the result is, because of the total oneness of Allah, it is acknowledged that he cannot in his nature, be a loving God. It cannot be a fundamental part of his substance. He might choose to love, he might will to be loving, but it doesn't flow out of him from his inmost being. It's not part of his substance. And now if you compare that idea of Allah to our idea of our triune God, which scripture clearly teaches, there is a God who can have love as a fundamental part of his being. There is a God who can send his son to die for your sins because he loves you. And as we read the pages of scripture, we see the love of the Trinity so clearly displayed. You remember what happened after Jesus Christ was baptized. He came up from the water. The heavens were torn open. The spirit descended like a dove. The voice of the Father from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. In Mark 9 verse 7, the account of the transfiguration Jesus Christ on the mount is surrounded by the glory cloud of God. A voice comes from the cloud, and the Father says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Jesus himself says to his disciples in John 15, verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And we could think, too, about the Holy Spirit Boys and girls, I'm sure many of you know what the fruits of the Spirit are. Galatians 5, verse 22. And if I were to ask you this afternoon, what's the first fruit of the Spirit? It is love. Because the Spirit is God, and God is love. Paul says the same thing in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. He says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And so, congregation, we see that God has been a God of love from all eternity, far before he created the world. 
Far before he created any one of you this afternoon, God has been a God of love, expressing that love eternally within the Trinity. And when God determined to create the world, that eternal love overflowed to us in every way. You know, God created the world, he created a good, and then he created mankind, male and female, as the crown of that creation, and in love he gave them glory and honor and dominion over the world. And even when we fell into sin, God showed himself to be a God of love. We read that again in 1 John 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. This is love he has been from all eternity, and he showed it to us. How did he do it? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And it's also from the love of God that he sends to us his Holy Spirit, the Spirit who works that faith in our hearts, the Spirit who is transforming us more and more into the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. Can you start to see something of the glory of the Trinity? Why did God send Jesus Christ to save you? Why did Jesus Christ come into this world to save you? Why does the Holy Spirit dwell in your hearts to transform you? It's because God is a God of love and he set his love upon you. And that brings some marvelous comfort as well because we know that God will never stop this. He will never stop being a God of love. Nothing in the past, nothing in the present, nothing in the future will separate us from the love of God. And it's not only that, but we also know that the love which God has for us is in fact the same love that he showed to his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And here I think of Jesus' own high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. Jesus prays in John 17 verse 23 about all those who would believe in him that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. And again he says in verse 26, I made known to them your name. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. You know, this is the glory of our triune God congregation why should you hold fast to the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, it's because God has revealed that in Scripture. Because our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are clearly shown on the pages of the Bible. And we also see that this triune God has been a God of love for all eternity. And it's because of that love of God that we are assured of our own salvation. An everlasting salvation which God shows to us as a God of love, both now and forevermore. Amen.